This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a horror, mystery, and thriller film called Devil. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. In Philadelphia, police officer Ramirez grows up believing his mother's story about the devil who roams the earth in search of sinful people that need punishment. According to him, the devil keeps his victims in a confined space while posing as one of them, only to torture and turn them against each other before claiming their souls one by one. Also, Ramirez remembers that his mother's story always begins with a person taking his own life and ends with the deaths of all those trapped. Meanwhile, Detective Bowden eats at a nearby diner while talking to his friend Henry. About forgiveness, Henry tells him his ability to forgive will determine the quality of the rest of his life, but Bowden argues that he can't just forgive the man who killed his family. After that, Bowden is called by his partner, Detective Markowitz to examine a crime scene. After noticing the water and absence of glass on the ground, Bowden tells Markowitz that the vehicle isn't where it used to be. He then deduces that the truck is rolled from the skyscraper across the street, where he believes a man had jumped from. He's also confident that their jumper wasn't thrown off the building, stating that a rosary isn't something that a person would grab in a panic. With no time to waste, the detectives go to the building to investigate further. Inside the building, Sarah, hurriedly walks in without signing into the logbook, which the substitute guard, Larson, notices. Larson tells the lady she needs to log in, and as she does, he informs his partner that he needs to take some papers to the 39th floor. Larson then enters the elevator along with the salesman, Vince, an elderly woman, Jane, the young woman from the lobby, Sarah, and a mechanic, Tony. Vince can't help but stare at Sarah, and Jane only gives him a disgusted look. Then, all of a sudden the elevator gets stuck, leaving them all stranded and frustrated. The CCT operators Lustig and Ramirez quickly notice the situation and report it to the repairman Dwight, who is currently working on the broken window. Dwight asks Lustig if he's sure that elevator 6 isn't working, and when the CCT operator says that he is, the repairman makes his way downstairs. Getting impatient, Jane incessantly tells Larson to do something about their situation, but the guard says that he's just a temp and starts to get irritated. Vince then interrupts and asks him to press the emergency button instead, and eventually, Lustig calls and informs him that the repairman is already fixing the elevator. However, they find it hard to talk to each other since they can hear Lustig, but the CCTV operator can't hear them. Upset, Larson borrows Sarah's phone since his own doesn't have a signal to call his partner intending to inform the guy that he won't be back at the security desk anytime soon. Unfortunately, he fails to contact him, and the loss of signal inside the elevator drives him even more infuriated. Hoping to defuse the tension, Lustig plays some music for the stranded people to which Vince happily sings along to, but he only annoys the others, so Sarah suggests that they should all just keep quiet. On the other hand, Bowden and Markowitz find a janitor sweeping shattered glass outside a building. Bowden tells him to stop cleaning the mess since it's a crime scene, and as he looks up, he notices a big piece of broken glass falling and pushes his partner out of the way before he gets hit. Meanwhile, Dwight sees nothing wrong with the elevator circuit. Back in the elevator, Vince proceeds to annoy everyone as he reads everything he can see inside. Then, Lustig calls to inform them that they'll try restarting the power, and as soon as the lights go off, Larson panics and holds on to Jane. When the power returns, the elderly woman snaps at Larson and tells him not to touch her, so the guard reveals that he's claustrophobic. Feeling sorry for Larson, Tony opens the escape hatch to let some air in, which the guard deeply appreciates. Larson then asks Tony if they can get out through the hatch, but Tony says they'll be safer inside the elevator. Meanwhile, Dwight decides to check the basement when Lustig tells him that restarting the power didn't work. Lustig also shares with Ramirez that someone had jumped out of window 35, making him wonder why. A few minutes later, Lustig tells the people in the elevator that they're still working on the problem. On the other hand, Vince urges Jane to buy a mattress from his company, telling the elderly woman she doesn't have to be as rich as Sarah to buy one. He also brags that he can tell from people's clothing how well off they are, and as he talks, the elevator music plays again. Sarah then gets startled when Vince grabs her from behind, and although the salesman denies doing anything, she warns him to never touch her again. All of a sudden, the lights start flickering, prompting Lustig to tell Dwight about it. Dwight then replies that he's in the basement and nothing's wrong with the elevator, adding that he isn't the one turning off the lights there. Running out of options, Dwight tells Lustig that he'll just return to the roof, climb down, and restart the car manually. The CCTV operators then continue to watch the passengers as the lights flicker in the elevator, and Ramirez gets confused when he momentarily sees a face on the screen. Meanwhile, Dwight almost gets crushed by another elevator while chasing away a raccoon in the basement. Back in Elevator 6, the flickering lights continue to make the passengers angry. Then, the lights completely go out, and when they turn back on, Sarah finds herself sprawled on the floor. 
Larson and Tony help her up, and that's when she realizes that she has a bite wound on her back, deep enough that it's bleeding. Enraged, Tony shouts at the CCTV operators to turn off the music even though they can't hear him. Luckily, Ramirez understands what he's saying and stops the song from playing. The passengers have no idea what's happened to Sarah, and when Larson notices the blood on Vince's suit that he's trying to hide, they all start thinking that he's the one that attacked the woman. Because of that, Tony suggests that they frisk him to see if he's concealing a serrated blade, but Vince refuses and insists that Sarah fell onto him. Curious, Lustig asks Sarah to show them her wound, and when she does, he finally decides to call the cops. Outside, Bowden bids forensic scene investigator Elsa goodbye after being called to respond inside the building. Meanwhile, Ramirez rewinds the footage from the elevator and shows Lustig the face he's seen earlier. Lustig tells him not to make a big deal of it, but Ramirez starts speaking in Spanish and holds his cross, freaking his partner out. A bit irritated, Lustig reminds Ramirez that they have a job to do and must remain calm. Back in the elevator, Larson and Tony desperately try to open the doors, which isn't much of a help. They also make sure to watch Vince, for they don't want him doing anything else. When Bowden and Markowitz finally arrive, Lustig explains to him that one of the passengers is suspected of assaulting the young woman. Bowden then assures the passengers that they're doing everything they can to get them out before asking Ramirez to call the elevator company and have them send someone in. Bowden also instructs Markowitz to send in the fire department and call Larson's agency to get all the info they have on him. On the other hand, Ramirez asks Lustig to tell the detective about the face they've seen, but Lustig just ignores him. To identify the passengers, Bowden instructs them to show their IDs on the camera. Unfortunately, Bowden finds it hard to see the letters on the screen, and when he asks if they have a pen, the people in the elevator say they don't. With no other choice, Bowden uses the logbook in the lobby to find out which of the visitors didn't show up for their appointment. Meanwhile, Sarah gets so worked up that she hallucinates everyone in the elevator is dead. Then, the lights go out again while the mirror behind Sarah shatters, and when the lights turn back on, they find Vince, stabbed in the neck with a shard of the mirror. Horrified, Ramirez quickly calls Bowden, Markowitz, and Lustig back to their office where Bowden decides to call for backup. Unable to keep quiet anymore, Ramirez tells him that whenever things go wrong, it means the devil is near. He then urges Bowden to consider the possibility that one of the passengers is the devil, but the detective pays him no mind and tells him to get his head in the game. Instead, Bowden and Markowitz rewind the elevator footage to find out who's attacked Vince, and as Bowden notices that Larson is the one nearest to the victim, Markowitz tells him that the guard has multiple records of assault. At the same time, the fire department finally arrives to rescue the stranded passengers. Determined to solve the case, Bowden examines the salesman's body through the camera and notices a paper in his suit. He asks a volunteer to show it to the camera, revealing the salesman's name as Vince McCormick, who has an appointment on the 35th floor. On the other hand, the passengers learn that Tony used to be a soldier. On the 35th floor, Elsa shows Bowden the jumper's suicide note that warns of the devil's impending arrival, making him confused. He then proceeds to Vince's appointment and learns that he ran a Ponzi scheme that cost many people their assets. Now with a lead, Bowden asks for Vince's client list, hoping to discover who has a motive to kill him. Meanwhile, the firefighters start working on opening elevator 6. Inside, Tony uses the escape hatch to look for a way out but his intention to help scares his fellow passengers into thinking that he's trying to escape. Larson then pulls him down and angrily tells him that they all need to stay inside until they get rescued. Frustrated, Tony suggests they frisk each other to get rid of their worries and suspicions towards one another. After some time, Bowden finally returns to the control room and instructs Markowitz to find which one of the passengers is on Vince's list. Ramirez then shows him the devil's face on the footage and says everybody believes in him a little bit, but the detective thinks otherwise. To prove his point, Bowden shows Ramirez the apology note on the back of a car wash coupon that was left in a hit and run site by the person who killed his wife and son five years ago. Bowden also adds that they don't need the devil and says people are bad enough by themselves, leaving Ramirez speechless. Bowden then notices recorded footage that shows Sarah was just pretending to be grabbed by Vince, while in the live one he sees the passengers frisking one another. Instead of leaving the passengers to their business, Bowden orders them to keep their hands off each other. Unfortunately, the people inside the elevator continue to distrust one another, and Jane even tries to pepper spray Larson after feeling threatened by him. Meanwhile, in the shaft, Dwight's attempt to help the passengers turns into a disaster when his harness snaps, sending him falling down to his death. The elevator passengers are startled when they hear a crashing sound from the ceiling, and as soon as they see the repairman's blood, they realize that something is wrong. From the control room, Lustig informs Bowden that Dwight has entered the shaft from the roof. Bowden then goes to the shaft entrance, where he informs Lustig of Dwight's accident, 
Bowden also realizes that the elevator is stuck on the 21st floor, so he tells Markowitz to instruct the fire department to go through the wall there. Later on, Bowden and his group learn that the young woman is Sarah Carraway, the guard is Benjamin Larson, and the elderly woman is Jane Kowski. Unable to identify who the remaining passenger is, Bowden asks the CCTV operators to find him footage of the mechanic. Meanwhile, the fire department begins to break a wall on the 21st floor. Back in the control room, Bowden and the other guys discover that Jane is a thief after seeing footage of her stealing a lady's wallet. Although he now knows that the elevator consisted of a scammer, thief, liar, and criminal, Bowden still feels uneasy that the mechanic's identity remains a mystery. Then, all of a sudden, Bowden gets shocked when his eyes play a trick on him and he sees the passengers dead. He asks the CCTV operators about it, but since he's the only one who's seen it, they think of it as a hard drive crash. Eventually, Bowden finds Tony on the CCTV and discovers that he was carrying a satchel upon entering the building. With the satchel missing, Bowden immediately assumes that Tony is the culprit. However, as he's about to leave and instructs his men to find the mechanic's bag, the lights inside the elevator start flickering again before finally going out. Ben even lights a match and fails to notice the figure standing beside him, and when the lights turn back on, Jane's dead body hanging from the ceiling using a light cord horrifies everyone. With two people killed inside the elevator, Bowden orders Markowitz to shut down the building and bring everyone to the lobby. On the other hand, Lustig goes to the basement to check on the shutoff valve before the fire department goes through the wall. As the men deal with the situation, Ramirez tells Bowden that the devil has chosen the people in the elevator because they're bad, and there's a reason why they get to be in his audience. Meanwhile, a woman tries and fails to enter the building even after telling an officer she's supposed to meet someone inside. In the elevator, Larson reluctantly helps Tony in taking down Jane's body. Tony then tries closing the elderly woman's eyes, but Larson tells him that won't work until they're dead for a few hours. Downstairs, the detectives finally locate Tony's satchel in the restroom. Back in the control room, Ramirez takes the radio and starts praying in Spanish, unaware that he's just aggravating the passengers. The people in the elevator are becoming more hostile towards one another, and when a fight breaks between Tony and Larson, Sarah eggs the guard to kill the mechanic. Luckily, Bowden returns to the control room in time and orders the fighting passengers to stay away from each other. He also orders them to put their hands on the wall before asking Ramirez how his story ends. Ramirez then nonchalantly tells him that the people will all die, but before Bowden could reply, Markowitz arrives and informs him that Sarah has three counts of blackmailing rich married men. He also adds that the young woman has an appointment on the 42nd floor with lawyer Wayne Kazan. So Bowden immediately moves and looks for the man in the lobby. After finding and asking the lawyer who might want to hurt Sarah, Wayne suggests they investigate her husband. Meanwhile, Lustig turns off the shutoff valve in the basement and informs the fire department to carry on with their work. However, Lustig sees a bad wire in a puddle of water and decides to remove it using a piece of wood, only to be electrocuted and severely hurt. He then makes his way out of the basement and stumbles into the lobby where the detectives talk about Sarah's unreachable husband. Bowden and Markowitz quickly come to Lustig's aid and ask for a medic, hoping that the guy will somehow survive. In the elevator, Tony starts suspecting Sarah and believes she's stirring things up to make them fight. Back in the lobby, none of the cops or guards notice that the woman from earlier has already made her way inside the building. On the other hand, Markowitz informs Bowden that Sarah's husband refuses to talk to them. Bowden then realizes that the young woman's husband owns Caraway Security and quickly returns to the control room, where Ramirez watches the lights in the elevator go on and off. Bowden is certain that Larson is working for Sarah's husband and believes that he'll kill the young woman, using the other victims as decoys to confuse the authorities. Suddenly, another outage occurs, so Bowden instructs everyone to point their cell phones towards each other. However, an invisible force suddenly snatches their phones out of their hands, and when the lights turn back on, Larson is already dead on the floor. The guard's neck is completely twisted around, leaving Sarah and Tony suspecting each other. Scared for their lives, the remaining passengers each pick up a shard of broken glass, but Bowden tries to calm them down by telling them how he almost drank himself to death months ago. He then asks them to put down the broken shards of glass while saying that they should take responsibility for their actions just like he did, and eventually, Sarah and Tony agree to do as they're told. However, the men are unaware that Sarah is hiding another piece of broken glass in her back pocket. A little while later, it becomes pitch black in the elevator once again. Frightened, Tony picks the phone up and shines it towards Sarah who's just equally as terrified as him. Sarah then decides to reach for the broken glass in her pocket, but when Tony loses the phone again, the two are forced to wait in the dark. When the power returns, Sarah ends up with a sliced jugular vein, wheezing as she struggles to breathe. At the same time, the woman from earlier, Cheryl, 
arrives and informs Bowden that she's Tony's fiance. She reveals that Tony has left his bag of tools in the restroom because he didn't want to take it to his interview and that she was late to pick it up. Confused, Bowden asks Cheryl for Tony's full name, and upon learning that his surname is Janikowski, he realizes that they've made a mistake in identifying the elderly woman. Suddenly, the elderly woman with black eyes stands up and asks the cowering Tony if he's finally ready to acknowledge his mistakes. A flashback then reveals that Tony was drinking while driving when he collided with Bowden's wife's car five years ago. Tony could only cry as he watched Bowden's wife and son die on the side of the road, and instead of calling for help, he just left them there. Tony apologizes for what he's done, and eventually comprehends that he's talking to the devil. So he begs her to take him instead of Sarah. However, his request only enrages the devil, and as a result, she makes the elevator drop a couple floors. Dwight's radio then falls inside the elevator when it stops moving, and as the devil interrogates Tony, he decides to take the radio and confess to killing a woman and his son on the Bethlehem Pike five years ago. Tony expresses how sorry he is, and once Bowden looks at his coupon, he realizes that the mechanic is responsible for his family's death. Defeated because of Tony's repentance, the devil eventually chooses to leave him and disappear. When the fire department finally opens the elevator, Bowden is alarmed to learn that Jane has vanished and orders his men to look for her. Later on, Bowden decides to take Tony to the police station. While in the car, he reveals to the mechanic that it was his family that he killed. Bowden has been waiting for years to confront the person who's taken his wife and son away from him, but instead of getting mad, he just forgives Tony. On the other hand, Ramirez remembers how his mother would always say that if the devil is real, then God is too. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.